Uh, Jane, uh, can I thank you for an excellent praises of our current cooperative measures and more importantly what our prospects are and uh, for enhancement of that cooperation. I suggest your ASEAN lessons learned uh, are well worth keeping in our minds as we go ahead. And of course, Jonathan, uh, thank you for your contribution as well. One thing I love about warfare officers is they can be given ambiguous and confusing information, take it as a challenge and come up with a pragmatic uh, suggestion for a way ahead. Um, you may now need to put on a flak jacket as we're going to take questions. Uh, firstly, um, there are two microphones again going around the room and available. Please put your hands up and uh, at any time during this session and uh, grab the attention of one of those people and they'll pass you a microphone. Uh, once you have the microphone and I indicate you to go ahead, please uh, indicate your name, country and organisation and uh, direct your questions to one or both speakers. And uh, I'll put on my sunglasses and, and we'll start at the back there. Thank you. Yeah, I've got um, one comment to make to Jane and one comment and question to make uh, to uh, Jonathan. Um, Jane, you on your first slide, you made the point that the Indo-Pacific is a new geographical construction. Well, the Indo-Pacific concept, to my knowledge, was introduced by Karl Haushofer in the 1920s. And one of the things that we have seen in the debate in recent years, say the last five years or so, has been the reintroduction of classical geopolitical language into the debate, words like pivots. Indo-Pacific is another one of those. So that's just a comment. And there's a bit of a history of that, and we can go into it later, but I just thought I'd make that comment. Jonathan, um, thank you for that excellent discussion I agree with you because, as you know, and we all know, um, all of the security constructions in the Indian Ocean are already all sub-regional. I mean, it's bloody big, you know, how do you organize it? Except that you made the point, and I think it's an excellent point, that navies can cooperate across those sub-regional boundaries. Uh, so that, that makes sense. Do you have a comment, though, about those states that are left outside of IONS that might have an interest in the security of those sub-regions that you identified? Um, I do, and I think it would be naive in any construct to deny the reality of extra-regional players, particularly ones that are, uh, are global players in the security environment. Um, they have always played a role and they always will continue to play a role. And to delineate or partition uh, those players outside of an operating space that they can legitimately um, move about in I think would just be counterproductive. So I think that um, we do need to be mindful of that and have the flexibility to engage in some, um, in some means um, to progress um, a way ahead in the Indian Ocean. And a good example of that is what's been done um, around the Gulf of Aden region where we've had a number of tight coalition task force uh, operating out of CMF 151, and we've had uh, NATO and EU 465 and 508. But we've also had a, a, a bevy of uh, international independent players, very heavy hitting ones, uh, the Chinese and the Russians and the Indians. Um, and they have managed to all operate uh, constructively together to deconflict through the shade uh, mechanism in Bahrain. Um, and that has allowed extra regional players that don't want to um, uh, align themselves or form up into any type of uh, coalition to operate um, and to act as force multipliers together. And in what was, up until about three years ago, um, the, the piracy, piracy story, as we all know, around that region was terrible. And we just could not find a way um, to solve it. And we weren't making too many inroads into it. Um, you've seen the stats now. Um, the latest IMO figures has piracy worldwide uh, down at a six-year low, and notwithstanding it has increased in other regions, that huge drop has been because of the remarkable decline, um, almost logarithmically, um, around that, that, that area. So that's a very long-winded answer to um, what was actually a, a difficult question that you posed to me. That... Um uh, it's a fundamental question to us, actually, is wider cooperation. I think, Jane, you'd like to contribute some more on that? Yeah. 
if I can just respond to uh, Prof. Lamley's uh, comment there. Um, admittedly, I'm a very poor history uh, student prof, but really, um, uh, the, the point that I'm, ma I'm making there is really more targeted, you know, at, at um, Singapore and, and also our Southeast Asian um, neighbors in the sense that, um, as, as I was telling Pak Hashim, that for us in Southeast Asia, we have really looked very little to the West. And, and that is also a key message in a policy paper um, that uh, I've produced and co-edited with Dr. Sam Bateman um, in, in as, as a recommendation to our region to say we really have to start looking beyond the Asia Pacific into the Indian Ocean and that you know the Indo-Pacific term is really new to us in, in our part of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question. Don't be backward in coming forward, and uh, while we uh, wait for you, I've got one for, for Jane. I think a fundamental challenge um, that Irons is going to have is um, yeah, some countries will be quite prepared to come to the table and work at various, at various levels in any future con uh, widening of the construct uh, and enhancement of the construct. But what about those countries who aren't or reluctant to come to the table and participate? Have you got any suggestions on how we can reach out to those countries uh, to get them on board? Well, I think you're quite right to asking me that question because uh, us in Singapore and in Southeast Asia, operating in the Southeast Asian uh, region, is that we are, we are very, very patient. With, with any initiative that we have, we have been working on, and I believe that you know, those of you Southeast Asian um, um, watcher would, would realize that you know, every process that we put in place um, takes a very long time to come to fruition. And it doesn't mean that you know we have not been doing anything. I think you know our, our colleague from from ASEAN will tell you that at every one year, um, ASEAN would probably have about a thousand meeting days in combina in total, anything to do with ASEAN or ASEAN affairs. And and yet the process is still very slow. So in in that sense, I, I guess you know my my direct reaction to you, sir, is that um, it, it's a multi pronged approach. Um, it, it should and also it should start from a bilateral approach as well to really understand you know, who your neighbours are, who your partners are, what are the key challenges, what are their issues, what are their concerns in, in coming to the table, and what, you know, at the bilateral level, how you can encourage them to say that you know, as a region, this is what we ought to be doing as well. And, and a lot of what you know, Jonathan's um, presentation um, suggest, suggested in his presentation about localized um, maritime security initiative or naval initiative is the other way to go as well. Before we look at the big picture, let's start small. We aim for the sky, but we start small. And of course, then, you know, there's that international upper tier initiative like forums like that, where, you know, I understand most, you know, um, naval initiative are very, very low key. You, you, you just aim to reach your objective, hush, hush. But there's also value in, in big bang events like that to put it out there to say, hey, we are coming together to do good work. But ultimately, I, I, I guess, you know, my, my point is that, you know, we just have to be patient and we don't give up. And we have always have to be very inclusive in bringing everybody to the table. Thank you. Um, Lee, down the end there. Uh, thank you. Lee Cordner, um, part-time retired naval officer and part-time academic. Um, this conversation we're starting to have here I find quite stimulating because in Jonathan's presentation he highlighted the need for capacity building and MDA amongst other things as, as being the need for the sub-regional groupings as well as I would suggest the wider region as a whole and uh, Jane talked about the need for patience and, um, and, and I guess persistence in working together but the, the, the sort of bigger question to me in the Indian Ocean regional context, um, and, and which I think perhaps there are more lessons and parallels out of the um, ASEAN slant um, Western Pacific case, is this issue of um, you know, who is going to build the capacity? Um, uh, who is going to uh, provide the sub-regional uh, and regional leadership I mean, in, in the West Pacific case, um, you know, we had the United States, we've had others, 
deeply involved, and, and Australia and others, in assisting the smaller states in building capacity. And I think we can see in ASEAN, the ASEAN maritime forces are now much more capable and mature than they were a long time ago. And that's, of course, a product of their economic emergence, but also uh, a lot of patient capacity support, building support over many years. Um, so in the I.O. case, how do you see that working um, in the sub-regional groups? And, and it begs the question that Dennis sort of alluded to and, and Jonathan responded to about the involvement of the external powers. Um, well, in the Indian Ocean case, clearly India is, is central as a, as a regional power, but also the roles of, of the US, China and others. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for the question. And, and in fact, it's, it's really a very key contribution and question that we have to be, we, we have to put a lot of thought into. I, I think, you know, in, 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 in relation, like the, the question of, of membership and, and who should be at the table is, is one important one, um, which, you know, I have no answer to because, you know, again, I myself and I agree with Jonathan and, and all previous speaker that not only should we be thinking about, you know, um, the Indian Ocean members um, coming to the table, but we have to recognize, you know, extra regional um, interests as well and, and, and what these countries can actually do in terms of contributing to regional stability and security. So in, in that sense, you know, the, the model that we often use in the, the Western Pacific, as, as you have suggested, is, is one of consensus. So, you know, having all of us already at the table and, and when we are thinking about, you know, potential working group, if, if that happens, is that, you know, number one, you, you have to have, you know, states who are willing to step up. There's no point in, in trying to, you know, nominate someone who is going to be a bit reluctant. That, that is not going to help in terms of, you know, initiating and anything that's going to be useful and, and, and progressive in that sense. But also be, be quite open to, you know, um, um, countries who are not within the round table to say, hey, can we learn, you know, from the US, for example, in, in a particular domain and whether they have something to contribute. Um, of course, you know, the level of participation, you know, may vary depending on, you know, how comfortable everybody is in, in, in bringing um, them to the table. But this is something that, you know, I will have to leave it to ION members to, to seriously consider when, when you're thinking about how do you progress from there. The very basic question of, of membership is one that we have to dedicate some time to thinking about. And, um, Lee, maybe fr at a very tactical level, uh, one idea you could, <coughs> we could do if you were to uh, divvy this up into a sub-regional approach would be for a, a members at the conclave to volunteer to act as a coordinator for their sub-region, uh, so just so that they could then work with the other member navies in their particular area to develop um, capacity building, MDA, naval cooperation, and, and that could rotate out or not uh, over a number of years. But I agree with exactly what Jane is saying. It would need to be clearly, uh, we would not be able to force members to do this. We would have to be completely volunteer, and it wouldn't, probably fall upon those member navies that had the capacity that could, could do this. Thank you. Uh, next question. David Brewster from uh, Australian National University. Uh, this is a, a question following up on Jonathan's slide about the uh, potential uh, uh, four-year program, um, which included bullet points of, uh, about capacity building and, and training and the like. And I was just wondering if uh, Jonathan might have any sort of personal suggestions of areas that would be uh, uh, potentially uh, focused on initially uh, in, in, those, in those areas. I think um, the way to do this is to play it in a very non-invasive, uh, non-sensitive manner. So. Core mariner skills can be developed and grown and cooperation through any manner of means, but I think the best way to do it would be, you know, say, in, uh, you started off in areas like search and rescue uh, would be a good example, uh, or humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And if you worked at that type of level with that type of outcome, you would uh, develop the capacity of all navies, um, but you would do it in a very um, benign manner. Um, I don't think that we would want to be working on 
cooperation at the at the more right hand ledge um, of uh, of say war fighting because I think that would clearly um, uh, be a bridge too far for many navies in the region. Uh, Your Excellency. And the High Commissioner for Sri Lanka in Aust Jonathan, I have a couple of questions for you. What made you to conclude your presentation with that chosen last sentence? I request you to read it out. The next one is that in 2007 and 2008, the Indian Ocean had about eight, 4,000 tonners with lethal cargo roaming around as floating warehouses intended to reach a destination. However, these warehouses were destroyed. What is the mechanism that you suggest that such situation arises again in the Indian Ocean, a destination immaterial. Thank you. Can I choose one, sir, and pass one over to my colleague? <laughs> <laughs> um, I may need to take the second one on notice because I wasn't too clear in the question. But the, So I take it you want me to read out the uh, last sentence that I, in, in my my speech here where I said naval cooperation is in essence about promoting collective self-interest over the individual interests of member countries and um, so what I was making there was uh, any concerted effort for naval cooperation by the very fact that you are operating with other navies and working with them you are doing that um, with a view that the interests of the group um, are probably um, uh, superior than your individual interests. You understand that whilst national interest is always supreme, that there is benefit in um, the sum being greater than the individual parts. It was not meant to be um, any type of uh, um, uh, political statement. It really does go to the heart of, of the merit of the tragedy of the, of the commons. And um, we talk a lot about um, in the Indian Ocean about protecting the region from others, but a purist could say um, that really we're trying to protect the Indian Ocean from ourselves. And by adopting um, a, a, an approach that um, involves naval cooperation, um, it, it opens you up to saying, I understand that we are all parties here and there's a very, and you would know being in Canberra, there's an, extra, an Australian expression we call NIMBY, not in my backyard, mm -hmm. meaning that as long as the problem is not in my backyard, I'm happy to pass it on to others. Pollution, uh, a, whole, uh, a whole raft of security issues. Um, if everyone adopted that attitude, then everything would be in your backyard because it would, particularly in oceans, transfer. Um, the ocean has no geographic barrier. And so um, I think um, by forums such as Irons where we understand that and by taking that mentality forward, we get ourselves in the situation that we know that the only way that we can manage and solve the security interests of the region is to do it collectively, sir. Jane, do you want to take this one? Uh, Dennis again. Sorry to keep on asking this, but... Um, I've uh, had some dealings with the Indian Ocean Rim Association for some years, and uh, I'll ask this to all three members of the panel, including Peter, the chair, and that is, um, has IONS had any discussion at all with IORA about one of the IORA's six priority areas, which, as you know, is maritime security? And if I could just carry on a little bit and uh, go tangential, I'm quite good at going tangential on this. If you consider 
the dialogue partners of IORA, they're all ex uh, you know, uh, ex out, out of the region. But apart from Egypt, they all have lots of resources. And the role of the dialogue partner in IORA is being reconsidered, particularly by Japan and the United States. And the dialogue partners could facilitate things that IORA might wish to do, and by implication, IORNS under that priority area, maritime security. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> um, well, I'll lead off on this, if you like, um, particularly on the linkage between uh, the IORA and IONS. Um, the last uh, IORA uh, conference was, of course, uh, here, led by the Minister of Foreign Affairs back in November. Um, I was uh, a representative from Defence at that activity and was the linkage on what was coming out of the IRA back into Defence. Um, here today, we have actually from um, Defence, uh, sorry, from Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, a number of senior people who are also looking at that linkage from now, from our IONS perspective, um, having been and led, in fact, sessions at um, IORA. So that linkage is occurring. Uh, I'd like to now pass on to uh, Jane, would you like to? Yeah, um, that will be actually my observation as well. Um, to share with you, the, our, our school, the Rajaram School, recently hosted or co-hosted a, a workshop with the IORA Secretariat in the Mauritius to, to discuss um, precisely you know, concerns over maritime security issue. And, and that point was raised in, in terms of how IORA should be interacting more with, with IONS and, and how their efforts you know, will have to complement um, and support the initiative um, within IONS as well. But of course, we understand that you know, um, the IORA membership is much smaller than IONS. And in that sense, you know, again, the question of, 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 of who comes to the table um, it's, it's something that we have to consider as well. But we, we definitely want any of the initiative within the region to, to complement each other in, in that sense. And you know, for that matter, you know, a, a the, the Indian Ocean Research Group is, is going to be an important entity that we, we look to as well to, to contribute towards the, the, the track to um, knowledge and, and capacity in, in that sense as well. Jonathan? Uh, I don't have too much to say. I was just trying to crunch some figures here that um, uh, the chairmanship uh, of Irons rotates every two years and there's 35 member states. Australia won't get it again in theory for 70 years. And so if you use the same terminology for, or the same math for IRR, um, and there's a casino around here, but I'm not too sure whether there's good odds. So I think it's around about one, um, one in about 5,000 chance that they'll be coincident again. Um, so now that they are coincident, um, maybe we need to uh, make hay while the sun shines. Uh, certainly, um, if you look at the final communique from the IRRA, um, there was a direct reference to it that they are looking to see the maritime security issue taken forward by um, primarily IONS. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Admiral. I might pull, no, got it. Uh, Rear Admiral David Johnston, Royal Australian Navy. Uh, John and Jane, thank you for both of your presentations. And my question is to both of you. Quite naturally, in both your presentations, given the genesis of IONS, you talked about government roles. So we're looking at sub-regional effects of governments coming together to look at matters of shared interest as being a genesis for it. I wonder if there is another significant partner that we should be looking at who in part provides cohesion of interest right across the region and in some cases across different threat areas and that's industry. So when we look at where uh, the role of capacity building and uh, what other partners might bring into the work that we are doing, whether industry has a role. And John, you mentioned that the great success in the Gulf of Aden with counter-piracy work for which Navies have been an element, but it's not only their efforts. And industry, through the adoption of best practices, have been a, con a key element to contributing to that. So I wonder in if our discussion, we need to open the aperture a little further than just the role of government agencies and look at potentially industry partners and what they might contribute to it, because they clearly have a strong interest. Yeah. 
I fully agree with you, Emerald. Um, and, and this one, we have a very good example um, in, in Southeast Asia in dealing with piracy issue. I think one thing we realize is that, um, you know, in, in, in dealing with the piracy issue, very often we only look at the data, but where did the data come from? It, it all comes from industry reporting. And so, you know, in, in that sense, we, we are totally reliant on the industry to giving us a picture of what the threat is out there and vis-a-vis -vis piracy. So increasingly, um, you, you see that, you know, um, in Singapore, the Information Fusion Center hosts um, shared awareness meeting every two months with, you know, um, locally, local and locally based um, shipping industry members come, come, come out to the, to the naval base, you know, share with them what are the current data, what, are, what is the Navy assessment of the situation, and then to compare you know, and to hear them out of their concern and say, you know, is this how, you know, how you're feeling when, when you're traversing to the waters? Numbers are down, are you feeling safer? If not, you know, why? Um, but the, 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 the point is, is and, and the modality is, is precisely as, as you suggested, that, you know, um, we navies, you know, you, you can do your role in, in, in defense, in, in, in constabulary and stuff like that, but that picture that, that you're, and, and, and that geographical environment that you're working with and, and working in is, is one that you need to know if, if you know, it's, it's actually contributing to, to the sense of safety and security of, of the public and, in this sense, you know, the industry per se. Uh, I echo what uh, Jane is saying, so I totally agree with industry. Um, two of the three factors that I highlighted in the Gulf of Aden were, uh, were, were played by industry when it came to piracy. Bark security teams are best management practices. Um, and I certainly think that, uh, and we, we talk about uh, protection of trade and sea lines of communi communication, but we're talking about protection of merchant ships. So clearly they have a fundamental role in providing um, uh, their own input to protecting um, themselves. The, I did make this point in the paper. Um, the reason I'd, I was slightly soft on it here is that in, we're only six years into irons, and to bring industry in now, just as we are really going through the mechanics of starting up this framework, um, I am cautious about making it, e making it even more difficult than what it is to start up an institution. Thank you. Uh, next question. Not escaping yet. Afternoon tea is probably not ready. Um, that gives the moderator a chance to ask another question. I'm going back to Jane, I think, on this one. There were some suggestions earlier, Jane, on the importance of establishing track two processes in the region. Um, what ways do you think that the track twos will actually contribute to what we're trying to achieve here? So I would like to think that, you know, um, the fact that I'm sitting up here um, delivering the presentation and engaging you is... is, is uh, attesting to the fact that you know there's recognition that we, we may have something different an alternative view to contribute um, in, in your difficult task of, of thinking about safety and security in the region and 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 by that you know I also refer to, to my point to professor Ramley and, and his important work with the Indian Ocean um, um, research group as well um, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll share two examples with you, and, and one, of course, is the workshop that we recently um, co-hosted with the IORA, where, you know, increasingly we are seeing that, you know, um, there, there is a need to, to engage, you know, our regional partners, not just at the official level, but also at the track two um, or, or track 1.5, where officials will come um, to, to, to some of these meetings in their personal capacity, really to understand and to discuss sensitive issues that often you cannot table at, at, at a track one level. And this is where I, I'll bring you to a, a, my second example, which is one that we experience in the South China Sea. Um, it is an honor for us to have here um, Ambassador um, Hashim Jalal, who has spearheaded a, a very long running uh, track two process in the South China Sea um, 20 years ago, but to, to put together the South China Sea workshop, because you know it, it, it is my own understanding that Precisely because the issue is, is so sensitive and, and so contentious that, you know, a lot of, of, of the, the kings are being meted out, you know, at the unofficial track two level. And, you know, we would like to think that, you know, that particular workshop has, in fact, contributed to the initial drafts and thoughts behind the, the declaration of the code of conduct. 
So in, in that sense, you know, um, we have seen, no doubt, you know, the process is also very long and tedious, but, you know, it, it provides an extra avenue for some of the issues and challenges that we have, we have discussed earlier that, that may impede regional cooperation and, and potentially be able to, to discuss in, in a very open and, 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 and non-partisan manner to, to allow for us to better understand, again, you know, our partners and, and to explore if there is means for, for better cooperation um, in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Uh, any other questions? I'm going to pose uh, one final question to um, Commodore Mead because the, the best cooperative concept, framework, construct that we could come up with still needs actually to be executed um, by our operational and tactical commanders on the ground. And Commodore Mead was recently commander of Task Force 150. So, Jonathan, could you perhaps... Um, is there anything from your experience there um, that you could pass on to us um, that would help inform on uh, the, the framework that we could come up with from the practical execution of it on the ground? I, um, perhaps I'm uh, uh, an eternal optimist, but uh, two years ago, uh, I was posted to uh, Bahrain under the Combined Maritime Forces to command uh, Combined Task Force 150, which is a, an organisation, or CMFEs, of, of 30 member, member states looking after maritime security. And 150 deals with uh, counter-terrorism, uh, counter-narcotics. And uh, 150 had been uh, in force for about 10 years and they had never had a successful um, uh, narcotics interception because of the vast distances of water um, and just the incredible complexity of trying to interdict and we always had a sense that there was narcotics being moved through the region to fund terror organisations and the more people I spoke to, a lot of civilians and all through the region were very despondent and I was told many, many times we will never find any narcotics in the region. We know it's there but it's just too difficult. Um, and as I pointed out, uh, in 2012, we had a, um, a couple of um, interceptions of narcotics. And as we're seeing now in 2014, um, I think they're up to, in the last couple of months, interception number six, seven, eight, at the value of $3 billion. That is really making a, a dent uh, in these terror organisations. And this comes about through naval cooperation. Um, Sometimes these problems can be so difficult that uh, you, know, you can develop a sense of learned hopelessness. But I'm of the view that there is not a problem out there that we could not crack collectively. Um, uh, you know, the, um, the navies in irons um, have got outstanding minds um, um, within, their, um, within their personnel. And once you work out a way to mature your tactics, training and procedures, um, we found through piracy, we're finding now through narcotics, and we'll find through any other challenge in the region, that if we work together, um, uh, we'll be able to crack it. Well, thanks, Jonathan. I hope Irons can uh, deliver um, a construct to support your optimism. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for your attention during this session. Uh, can you please thank uh, again our two presenters, Jane Chan and Commodore Jonathan Mead.